and welcome everyone. My uh, name is Joanna Schuker and I'm the Director of Design and Innovation here at the RSA. Thank you for joining us for the third event in our Reclaiming the Future series co-hosted by RSA Oceania and the RSA Sustainability Network as part of our Regenerative Futures programme. The programme's vision is to help create a future where people and planet flourish hand in hand. In this series, we look at how we can nurture our ability to think long term and to create a culture of intergenerational and planetary responsibility. We know too well that humanity has reached a critical inflection point. Our fixation on short term problems and goals is threatening the long term survival of our species and our planet. Now more than ever, we urgently need to expand our time perspectives to think, dream and plan for the long term. In the last session, my colleague uh, Philippa Jithi explored the connection between time, people and place, looking at how our view of the long term is shaped by our relationships with the land and with each other. In her discussion with Norm Sheehan and Alana Marsh, they talked about the need to view the world with a systems lens and to recognise uh, the impact each moment in time can have on other interrelated parts of the system, people, other living things, country, extending across space and time. In this session, we'll shift perspectives and begin to explore short-termism in our institutions and structures, and look at how we can embed more long-term approaches in our political systems. Joining us to discuss how we can create an intergenerationally just and inclusive politics for the future are our wonderful experts, Simon Caney, Professor of Political Theory, Graeme Smith, Professor of Politics and author of Can Democracy Safeguard the Future? And Jane Davidson, original architect of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Wales Act and author of Future Gen. Um, welcome to all of our speakers. Um, but before I hand over to speakers, uh, let me just go over a few housekeeping notes. This event is being recorded for our podcast and YouTube channel. So please keep your microphone on mute while our panel is speaking. There will be a chance for the audience to ask questions after the discussion. So please post uh, your questions in the chat and we will try to get to as many of these as we can. We also encourage you to get involved in the discussion on social media using the hashtag hashtag RSA time rebels and hashtag join the regeneration. My colleague Patrick is here with us in the background helping with the tech. So if you have any issues or questions, please send him a message. Now it's my great pleasure to welcome our first speaker for today's event, Simon Caney. Simon is a professor of political theory at the University of Warwick and a member of the Nuffield Council of, on Bioethics. His research focuses on how best to reform existing domestic and international institutions in order to promote greater long-term thinking and intergenerational equity. Simon, welcome. Over to you to tell us more about this topic. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the, the very warm welcome. I'm just going to uh, try and find my PowerPoint and share that. So um, in my sort of 10 minutes introductory comments, I, I want to uh, make three key points and perhaps linger on the third one. Uh, so here are three messages. One is we have a problem of harmful short-termism. And uh, it's already been mentioned that this affects the environment, but I want to convey that it affects pretty much all dimensions of public policy. So message number one is short-term decision-making is endemic, and it affects a wide variety of different policy areas. And as such, we betray our responsibilities to future generations as well as don't serve our own long-term interests. And so this isn't just about climate change, though of course of paramount significance is the fact that we're bequeathing future generations an increasingly warming world with rising sea levels and severe um, weather events. And, it, and it's crucial to bear in mind why this is a long-term problem. It's a long-term problem because greenhouse gases live in the atmosphere for hundreds, indeed thousands of years. And so what we do now uh, lingers for many uh, years to come. And the way we design towns and cities, uh, the way we structure our urban environment 
affects our energy use and thereby also locks people into high emissions in the future. And so we really need to think about these issues right now and take the long view. And this is true not just for climate, but also biodiversity loss. We are causing and experiencing massive biodiversity loss. And, and this is going to uh, leave future generations with an increasingly degraded world. It's also worth noticing, though, because some people's uh, commitment uh, to the environment is not as strong as others, that for many other issues, taking the short term view is endemic and very harmful. So health is another area. Uh, early years, um, health is of crucial significance, but often neglected. Uh, COVID is, of course, a, a supreme example of how being ill prepared um, causes immense harm and unnecessary loss of life. If we think of other disasters like um, hurricanes and earthquakes, in almost all cases, the experts will tell us that a failure to prepare results in much worse loss of life and much higher costs. And we can see the same things, whether it's economic policy, whether it's investment in infrastructure, whether it's housing, education, new technologies, foreign policy. All the experts will tell us that uh, short-term decision-making is prevalent and it doesn't serve our interests well or the interests of future generations. So message number one is we really do have a problem. Message number two is about the causes, because ultimately, of course, we need to think about how we're going to address these problems. And to do that, we have to think about why does harmful short termism occur? Um, if someone says they've got a proposal for dealing with it, but it's not responsive to the causes, it's unlikely to work. So here I want to say, look, there are four things that we need to bear in mind. Uh, one is there are features of human psychology, our, our cognitive makeup, our, our psychological dispositions that lead us to focus on the here and now. So we respond to vivid and uh, risks and experiences, but not to dry general social scientific trends. And those don't move people to act. And since our knowledge of the future tends to come in this form, we're less motivated than if a disaster happens right now. Secondly, we, we tend to be overconfident and suffer from positive illusions. We overestimate our capabilities. I'm sure it'll be fine, we think. We often procrastinate and postpone difficult decisions. For example, if you think of something like the pensions crisis, we've known about this for about two decades, if not more, that this was going to occur. But politicians have tended to delay making hard decisions. And we tend to privilege the urgent over the important. And as many point out, this leads to underinvestment in things like infrastructure. So that's one factor. But secondly, there are features of our political systems uh, that incentivize the short term. Obviously, electoral cycles do that, budget cycles, high turnover in government office and in cabinet, having short term performance targets. Uh, these all incentivize politicians and civil servants to think for the short term, not the long term. And there's very little reward for someone who's going to put forward a policy measure that may be costly now, but will reap enormous dividends in the future. So the internal structure of political systems tends to reward the short term. And then the third factor is, uh, to put it a bit grandly, we have an intertemporal anarchy. And what I mean by that is that a government is in charge for a certain period of time, but then someone else takes over, and then someone else takes over. And because of this, there's a collective action problem. We can never be sure that the policies we enact will also be adopted by the future generations. So uh, people sometimes query, well, why should they put forward an aggressive mitigation policy if others are just going to undo it? And then here's the fourth, and I think perhaps most significant fact, which is one major constituency is not there, namely future generations. They're politically vulnerable. They cannot campaign, they cannot vote, they cannot protest, they cannot throw the rascals out, all until it's too late. And, and so they are affected by the decisions and they're bound by the decisions, but they have no say. And that's a problem. So if you put all of these together, there is what I would like um, to call the mismatch, which is we have problems that require taking the long view, 
But we have a human psychology in the way we set up societies that's very focused on the short term, whether it's the incentives facing politicians or the fact that future generations are affected but don't have a say. And the mismatch is the root of the problem then. Let me turn then to message three, which is we can do something about this. Uh, our institutions are not set in stone. They weren't generally designed for problems like climate change or biodiversity loss, but we can change things and we can try and respond to some of those drivers. So here are a few suggestions and you'll hear more from my colleagues, uh, uh, Jane and, and Graham. One is we often don't have a clear sense of what's coming towards us, what the trends are. We're very bad at dealing with what uh, environmental scientists call creeping problems. Um, so one thing we need is a council for the future to produ produce long-term projections about the trends facing society so that we know what's on the horizon. Secondly, we can require our political parties to issue their manifesto for the future, their account of how they're going to respond to these challenges. We can demand that they tell us how they're going to um, yield a, an Australia or a New Zealand or a United Kingdom or whatever in 50 years. Otherwise, it'll just get squeezed out by the present. It'll get crowded out by the clamour for the present. We can set aside certain days of the year in the parliamentary calendar and in just the normal calendar, what I've called visions for the future days. That is days earmarked for thinking about future challenges where we can get together and discuss and hold politicians accountable for their visions for the future. What I'm trying to suggest is there's a tendency to push the future out of our picture, out of our politics, to just keep our head down and focus on what's right in front of us. We can make the future part of the agenda that's right in front of us. We could have an annual state of the future union in which politicians set out their visions for the future and NGOs and civil society groups can challenge them on that and contest them on whether that's feasible, whether it's practical, whether they've thought it through, whether they really are going to deliver on it. Um, ooh, uh, my PowerPoint, I think, is jammed now. Yeah, I seem to have... Ah, oh, no, sorry, one more slide. Sorry, two more slides. We can also create an institution within a parliament, a committee for the future, or in Wales, as Jane will say, um, have a future generations commissioner. There's someone whose job it is to think about the future, someone who can hold other politicians to account for the future. And then the final thing, and this is something that I think Graham will talk a lot more about, is we can have what uh, Klaus Legwe and Patricia Nance call future councils, which is groups of ordinary citizens selected randomly who are charged with thinking about the future, with feeding their proposals into the policy process, with challenging politicians uh, as to why they're not doing enough or what they're doing. And we can even have, as has recently just been instituted, a global version of this, because one was set up uh, as the COP negotiations begin in Glasgow um, this month. There's a new global citizens assembly. And the point about these uh, is thinking about the future should not be an elite project dominated by politicians. It should be one that can harness, us, harness the power and potential of ordinary everyday citizens who may have concerns about some visions for the future, who may have different views. And it's important in a democracy to feed those in. So those are some ideas about how we can um, make changes that will gear society to govern for the future. So here are the three messages. We do have a problem. We know what the causes are, and we can do something in response to those causes. What I've said isn't the, aren't the only ways of doing it. There may be other ways. There may be better ways that you have in mind, but there's some ideas that I think are worth exploring and putting out there. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to questions and queries. Thank you so much, Simon, for these uh, really rich insights and ideas. I'm sure we'll pick up some of them um, in the discussion, and I can see there's already some questions in the chat for you. So let's definitely pick these up later. And something that you said that really sat with me was, you know, what, what we do now um, lingers for many years to come. So the sort of that sense of, you know, let's, let's leave this place better than we found it. Um, and how do we think about our, our sense of agency and access?
an option now and its implications in the long term. Thank you um, so much um, for that presentation. Um, I'm now uh, delighted to welcome our second speaker, uh, Graeme Smith. Graeme is a professor of politics um, and director of the Centre for the Study of Democracy at the University of Westminster. Graeme is an expert in uh, democratic theory and practice and is the author of two books, Can Democracy Safeguard the Future? and Democratic Innovations, Designing Institutions for Citizen Participation. Graeme, welcome and over to you to share your thoughts. So thank you so much uh, for the invitation. It's a real, it's a real pleasure to be here. Right. So um, I'm very much following from what uh, Simon has said, um, and my what I'd like to think about a bit is uh, is about the kind of principles and practices of designing democracy and democratic institutions for the future. And Simon's already given us a really interesting menu of um, menu of particular uh, institutions that he thinks are worthwhile. And one of those I'm going to develop uh, in more detail, looking at citizens assemblies in, in this talk. What I want to start with, though, is um, thinking about sort of some of the principles that might um, that might undergird um, future regarding institutions. And um, I've kind of picked out three here. There, there are more, but actually hearing what Simon said about the institutions that he's interested in, I think the, they, that they pick up very much on, the, on these principles. The first principle is a principle of independence. And what I'm talking about here is trying to create institutional spaces that are independent um, of some of the political drivers that Simon was talking about. So things like uh, the um, elect, removing the sort of dynamic of the electoral cycle, um, potentially uh, also um, something that Simon didn't particularly mention was the, the power of entrenched and vested interests. So trying to create some sort of space which is independent of some of those political uh, dynamics that undermine long-term thinking. The second is um, maybe it may strange, it sound like a strange principle, but it's a principle of diversity. Um, and Simon alluded to the fact that a lot of the kind of ideas that are generated around um, uh, future future regarding design are actually uh, the creation of elite institutions are very often um, you know uh, uh, significant politicians judges or um, or scientists who are taking a, a a role in in guiding society now I think there are roles for the, some of those institutions but I think the principle of diversity is important and the, the reason I say that is because most policies and uh, that we enact have distributional effects within and across generations. They, um, we're seeing um, new inequalities emerge and existing inequalities enhanced. And the argument here is that those people who are suffering those kinds of vulnerabilities now are in a better position to understand the impact of those vulnerabilities in future generations. So the argument here is that we need to bring people with very different positions within society into decision-making about the long-term because they will have different perspectives on what the interests of, of different uh, of different parts and sections or, or sectors of the um, of the long uh, of future generations will be. So there's an argument here of trying to, to create institutions that have independence and that then also have uh, diversity in their out in their in their experience and perspectives on the world and what uh, and what the future is it will bring. The third. Um, uh, principle I want to suggest is, is, is a particular way of doing politics, is deliberation. And why I think deliberation is interesting is because I think it responds to some of the human psychology issues that Simon was referring to. Deliberation is that idea that decisions are made through the free and fair exchange of reasons between, between equals. Um, and it, the argument and the empirical evidence suggest that when people are engaged in deliberation, they're much more other regarding. And that isn't just other regarding within generations, but across generations as well. It's what um, some psych social psychologists have referred to as a form of slow thinking. It takes us away from the fast thinking, the everyday ways that we react to the world and brings us into a space where we consider the needs and interests of others. And although future generations cannot be present there, it, 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 uh, they're, they're they are considered in a way that they aren't in other forms of political uh, political um, engagement. So 
those three ideas of independence, diversity, and deliberation, I think, need to need need to be embedded in in the institutions which we develop for thinking about for, for ensuring future regarding um, policy and practice. Now, I'm not sure that any single institution can embed all of those. And what's interesting about Simon's um, uh, menu of institutions is different institutions to get you know bringing them together may well realize these dif these different principles. But I do want to spend some time in this talk talking about one institution, set of institutions that I think are particularly interesting here. And this is citizens assemblies. And we've recently had a wave of assemblies uh, in relation to uh, climate, particularly in Europe. And so we've seen one in the UK, in France, in Denmark, in Scotland, uh, and in, in Ireland as well. And this is the first time really that citizens assemblies have been used at a sort of national level. Um, consistently across a whole series uh, of different countries. And there is what the OECD is referring to at the moment as a, as a deliberative wave. I have some problems with that metaphor because a deliberative wave can crash. And I'm actually hoping that we'll see it, we'll see, we'll see the kind of practice increase and improve over time. So I think there, there might be some problems with that metaphor. Uh, why am I particularly interested in these sorts of institutions? Well, I think they have characteristics that embed the design the design principles that I was suggesting at the start of the talk. And that's because they combine two particular elements and that's random selection and uh, facilitated deliberation. And those two um, elements are really important, I think, for, because for ran random selection, first of all, generates a diversity of perspective. Um, Random selection, I won't go into the details of this, but uh, the way that random selection is, is practiced within climate assembly, uh, citizens assemblies <coughs> ensures that, uh, that the group of people selected mirror the, the characteristics of the broader population. So you, in terms of age, in terms of gender, in terms of all sorts of uh, ethnicity and other, and other um, demographic and social characteristics. So we have that diversity in this body. And I think they are actually pretty much the most diverse institutions that we find in our politics today. The second thing goes back to Athens, to Athenian democracy, and the it, random selection was introduced in Athenian democracy uh, as a way of protecting against elite families who are undermining the who are undermining the polity. And it was a way of ensuring that there was no concentration of power amongst particular vested interests or elite groups. So there is a way that random selection actually is that it uh, works in order to undermine the power of vested interest and it brings in people uh, who are not um, subject to the electoral cycle. And then the other aspect of it is deliberation. These processes are carefully structured and facilitated so that people are um, provided with information, they learn about the issue, they have a chance to deliberate, uh, deliberate with uh, people with very different perspectives and then work together to generate recommendations. So I think it's, there's a really interesting institutional combination of factors here which mean that they are well set to deal with long-term issues and what's really striking for me is that actually the evidence suggests that this is, this is actually the case if you look at almost any outputs from uh, citizens assemblies they are much more future regarding than our current institutions there is something going on in this combination of random selection and deliberation that is generating much more future regarding outcomes so Let's be recognised, though, that this is still a niche practice. This is still um, the very early days of, of citizens' assemblies. Actually, there's been practice in this for about 50 years, but it's only in the last few years that these, have been, this, these, these institutions have been taken seriously. So we're still in the early days of their design, still in the early days of their application. They tend to be ad hoc. They tend to be one-off affairs, and they ha as yet, they haven't really been institutionalised. There's some places like East Belgium that have institutionalised them within their uh, parliamentary and government system, but actually at the moment they tend to be ad hoc and really mu very much driven by the uh, elite concerns dominated by public authorities decisions about when and where to use these. And then finally, they tend not to have that much power. Uh, there are examples, for example, in, um, in Poland where mayors have agreed before assemblies start that they will um, implement the recommendations that come out if there is near consensus, 80% of support within the assemblies, but we haven't seen that kind of practice spread very far. And so what we're doing is we're creating citizens assemblies to deal with problems, look at, look at problems like climate change, because there's a recognition 
that our system is, is dysfunctional in the way that Simon suggested. But then, of course, the recommendations from that assembly are going back into the dysfunctional political system. And surprise, surprise, they're not always acted on. So I think one of the big things is we've worked out that things like citizens assemblies are really great places to consider the long term. The problem is how are we going to how, how are we going to embed them more effectively within our political system? I don't want to suggest that this is the only way of doing future regarding politics. And I agree with many of the things that Simon said in the book that was mentioned earlier, Can Democracy Safeguard the Future? I talk about all sorts of other things, including what's happening in Wales. And um, we're going to hear more about that in a second. I've also started working um, on a project with the European Climate Foundation called the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies. So please come and have a look. If you're interested in climate assemblies, have a look at that website. Um, get involved in, in that project, because I think there's a really interesting moment right now of, of the potential for climate assemblies to become a more significant part of our institutional structures. Um, you know, whether that window, whether, whether we really exploit the opportunity is it, we, we will see in two or three years time, but there is really an opportunity for a movement around climate assemblies that I don't think we would have expected a couple of years ago. So thank you for that. Um, I hope I've offered a bit of good news in terms of some of the ways that we can think about uh, future regarding institutions, because as, as is being pointed out by all the speakers, this is so necessary. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Graham. And I'd love to come back um, in the plenary to that sort of provocation you shared with us around how you shift some of that work from being the niche into that mainstream. Um, so we'll definitely come back to that. Um, it's now my uh, great pleasure to welcome our third speaker, Jane Davidson. Jane is a Pro Vice Chancellor Emeritus at the University of Wales Trinity St. David's um, and the author of Future Gen Lessons from a Small Country. From 2000 to 2011, Jane was Minister for Education and then Minister for Environment, Sustainability and Housing in the Welsh Government, where she proposed legislation to make sustainability the central organising principle. The Wellbeing of Future Generations Wales Act came into law in 2015. What an amazing achievement, Jane. Uh, over to you. Well, thank you very much um, indeed for inviting me to participate uh, in, in this particular webinar. And I'm particularly pleased to be on with the other guests um, because it's really important that any idea uh, that is put forward is rigorously tested. And I'm particularly interested in the in the fact that we we, we need everything <laughs> that, that Simon has talked about and Graham has talked about if we're going to start changing um, political systems. But I, I, I just want to say a little bit about, in a sense, the journey of Wales. And in this context, when we're talking about um, decolonizing the future, um, in, in many ways, politics has no room for these kinds of discussions. Um, we elect people on short term manifestos. Uh, we expect them to deliver on whatever they've said within the timeline. So by their very nature, we're always talking about short term decisions. Uh, and yet, if we think about, you know, some of the big issues in, in the UK at the moment, whether that's about um, energy supply, whether that's about social care, the long term health of the health service, all those issues, what kind of education, and uh, this is a particular interest for me, what kind of education is appropriate for the 21st century with all these challenges around? And how do you change education systems when in fact, every time you want to change it, you have a sort of 15 year element whereby children go in and come out the other side. So, <laughs> so changing some of these elements are really, really long term. And I think for me, the the main challenge um, when I was privileged enough to become a minister in the cabinet in Wales in, in education and then sustainability was actually about, well, how do we make the ch classic short termism in politics longer term? And I felt that we had the most immense opportunity in Wales, which actually others didn't have, because when we were set up as the for initially as a National Assembly for Wales, we were having actually given in our constitution the duty to promote sustainable development in everything that we did. I thought this was brilliant. Um, and I kind of like wholeheartedly got behind it as a, as, as a number of others did. 
And I think the story, and, and Simon highlighted this, about the fact that policy changes. I mean, even within a political party, policies change from election to election. And what was extraordinary to me in the period of time I was um, a minister is we had this duty to promote. The duty was taken seriously enough um, so that people knew they had to report upon it. And yet in the 10 years before I proposed what is now the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, we had never failed in our duty to promote from the audit perspective. We had never failed. And that's because promotion is rhetoric. And the, the gap between promotion and delivery is a gap that we see in every political system, including in Wales. I'm not saying that Wales is special on this front, but in every political system, the rhetoric or the ambition quite often does not have a plan underneath it in terms of guaranteeing any kind of positive outcomes in the agenda that you want to take forward, particularly if it's beyond an electoral cycle. So when I became the um, uh, environment sustainability and housing minister with the responsibility for taking this agenda on promoting sustainable development forward, I uh, promoted it by getting the cabinet to agree, and it was unanimous, so it wasn't, there was no problem in this, people, people were struggling with how to do it, not that they didn't want to do it, but I got the cabinet to agree that we would make the sustainable development our central organising principle. And I, I, I was stupidly, foolishly, naively thought, right, that's my job done. <laughs> we've got it now. We've nailed it. We're all we've all agreed on this. It's a cabinet decision. So all the civil service, all the ministers are just going to go with this. Um, uh, it doesn't happen like that, because actually still for the civil service in particular, they did not know how to do it because it was not defined in any way. I mean, we had defined. Uh, the phrase sustainable development, we, we, we went straight back to the, uh, the, the first Earth Summit, we used the 1987 um, definition of, of development that does not compromise the ability of future gen generations to meet their own needs, the Brundtland definition. So they had that, but that wasn't enough to help them in their daily jobs to define whether or not the decisions they were making were appropriate. And I think that they, it's just a really, really important kind of message that I want to get out as a politician rather than an, as an academic is that if you're going to do a fundamental change there needs to be a what i.e what you want to achieve but really importantly and this is a massive gap in 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 most politics there needs to be a how how you are going to get from where you want to be to where you want to go so where you are where you are to where you want to go. And I think, you know, it's a number of the mechanisms that both Simon and Graham have outlined, I think are really exciting ways of recasting this. And also remember that politicians are elected by the people and politicians will often only go as far as the people will let them. So there's a massive issue in the context of democracy about how far can the people push politicians? And I think the big test on that is actually going to be COP26, because my feeling at the moment is that governments in many ways are way behind where the people want them to be when we look at the levels of concern about climate change and everything else. So there is no one solution, but I think that what we did in Wales is an experiment which is now proving of, of quite a lot of interest elsewhere. And I'll just share um, my slides now to just sort of show people who, who are not aware of this experiment, which has been referred to a couple of times, but uh, you know what the experiment actually is. So here you have um, the, uh, the overarching architecture of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act that was passed in uh, 2015. And very simply, it is seven goals um, in the circle, all interconnected, hence the jigsaw, which actually reflect the sustainable development goals. So basically we're in a, a framework that has uh, seven goals which are interrelated, um, uh, that cover everything from social, cultural, 
environmental and economic outcomes. But prosperity is redefined as low carbon. Um, and the goals all reference climate change and also issues around equality in society, etc. But really importantly, we also have five ways of working. And those five ways of working um, uh, are you have to be collaborative. You have to think long term. You have to be preventative. Uh, you have to involve people about whom decisions are being made. And you must um, uh, also integrate the outcomes of the goals. Now, I know that we're uh, in the sort of sixth year since the beginning of the legislation. But in, in essence, in the first two or three years, all the public authorities in Wales, including the Welsh government, had to determine how they were going to deliver on this. Um, and it was really tough. And they created a first set of wellbeing plans that I was personally incredibly disappointed with because the bar was so low. But even in the last two years, as people have started to understand the way they need to think longer term, they need, the way they need to involve younger people in decision making, the way they need to think beyond political terms, we're starting to get some really exciting um, initiatives. And I've explored all this um, in, in, in my book, Future Gen, Lessons from a Small Country. But I think one of the key lessons is that if you don't start doing something like this, you don't actually see the benefit of changing the frame, looking upstream and saying, if we can't deliver on the duty to promote sustainable development with a law, at least you can guarantee outcomes in the sense of uh, lasting longer than one administration. And Simon mentioned the fact that what we also have is an independent commissioner for future generations. And interestingly enough, our first commissioner, um, uh, a woman called uh, so Sophie Howe, um, she's been appointed for seven years, and that is quite deliberate. She's been appointed for seven years because those seven years reflect a period longer than the, than the initial electoral cycle of a government. And therefore she brings intelligence and experience and understanding and an ability to critique and review, particularly alongside the Wales Audit Office, to all public services, including the Welsh, the, the Welsh government. And because it's linked to the SDGs, oddly enough, it has made Wales the first country in the world to legislate uh, to in factor in future generations into law, which I have to say was deeply shocking. I mean, some of you would have heard me say that before because I couldn't believe that we could still be in a situation where no country other than Wales, not a member state, had legislated in a way that would bring the SDGs into law. But I think the, the, the core of my message is that legislation and regulation are really important tools. All the democratic tools are important too, but one of the aspects of the Paris Agreement, which many people don't know about, is that uh, right at the end of the decision making in Paris in 2015, when it looked as though the conference was going to fail, one of the things that Francoise Hollande, as the um, uh, president, uh, was able to sort of pick out of the, of the detritus was the idea of a ratchet mechanism in order to achieve long-term outcomes. Now, we were able to use that in Wales in the context of recycling, a ratchet regulation with financial penalties that meant the public services had to recycle certain amounts every year and that that got ratcheted up every year. And by 2025, all local authorities in Wales are expected to have recycled 75% of their waste. Now that takes it away from landfill as a long-term problem, uh, for example, but also what it's done is changed opportunities in Wales and changed understanding of acting sustainably. And I think the really important aspect of that is a ratchet mechanism on government means then government has to work with its people in terms of looking at how to deliver on it. That could not have been done immediately top down. That had to have the support of the people in terms of driving forward. And now Wales is competing with Singapore and Germany to be the best recycling country in the world when we were the worst 
in the early 2000s. So I just wanted to put in that one, that mechanisms that ratchet up performance over a period of time, such as the climate change legislation does um, in the UK, but also the separate legislation in Scotland and Wales, are really useful mechanisms to drive change. And then we need to think about the democratic input. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jane. I know that um, you know the work that you've done is sort of one of the one of the examples or the main examples that we hold up at the RSA when when we get any skeptics saying that it's impossible to shift our institutions to think longer term about um, the well-being of future generations and and the well-being of our Earth. So thank you again so much for sharing um, your experiences and how you've been championing that work so vividly. Um, I'm uh, going to kick us off with a few questions. There are loads of questions in the chat, so I will also be fielding these over to you in, in a few minutes. Um, if anyone in the audience uh, would like to ask any more questions, do feel free to pop them in the chat. And if you want to direct your question to any one of the um, panelists, um, definitely mention their name and I'll make sure that um, that, that we can do that. So uh, just to kick us off, um, you all shared some insightful challenges um, standing in the way of shifting our institutions and policies uh, towards long-term thinking. So you mentioned things like election cycles, funding cycles, legislation, regulation, you know, shifting education systems, to even sort of shifting social values that are placing this focus on, you know, what is urgent now rather than what is important for the longer term and for future generations. Um, all of these things you've discussed are fundamental infrastructures that we currently hoard in our current system, in our current society, in our current institutions, and they're also fundamental mindsets that we hold. Um, and these can be really hard to shift and change um, systemically and systematically. Um, from your experience working in this space, where should we start and who needs to be driving this? Graham, I feel like you want to come in. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard. Uh, I mean, it is really important. The, the, one of the things, one of the things about um, social and political change is it's usually comes from unexpected directions. So you need people working on this stuff in all sorts of different ways. So, you know, one of the things I shared in the chat was that um, one of the reasons that the French uh, ran a climate assembly was as a response to the yellow vest movement one of the reasons the uk ran a climate well one of the reasons the parliamentary committees in the uk commissioned a report was feeling sort of the pressure from extinction rebellion so there's a kind of social movements role here there's mm -hmm. the people um, who are working in government or in um, research uh, or in um, or 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 in think tanks who just keep plodding and waiting and working and working and hoping that a moment comes when they when their ideas are able to to be latched on then you've got people like jane and others who've got force forward thinking politicians who see an opportunity so, so there's it you, you never know you know what's really interesting at the moment is there are is there are so many people working from different perspectives and and with different opportunities and at some point they will happen. So I, I've, I've worked for 20 years on citizens' assemblies. For the first 18 years, no one, no one wanted to hear a word <laughs> I said. And then suddenly in the last two years, I can't, I, I, my diary is full. And I've now been asked to run a, a, you know, this knowledge network on climate assemblies. Now, that is only a small thing, but that's a, that there is a window opening. Um, and, they, it, and, and who knows where that's going to go? It could be that in two years' time, this was a flash in the pan and it all disappears, but it might not be. So, so that was an example of someone like myself just working away on this stuff. And then suddenly a policy window opens. So I don't, I don't think you can kind of plan and say, that's the route you need. You'd actually need a diversity of different actors and a movement <laughs> requires people inside and outside institutions. It requires people working in different ways. And at certain points you find that time i don't i don't i don't know what jane feels from her own experience looking back but you know for me a particular window opened up in 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 um wales at a particular moment which she and others exploited but it could it could it could be a, it could have been a different trajectory yeah Great. yeah Thank can you, i yeah i, of course, I, I, I will say I will say something about that because it, it, it it's actually quite an amusing story which is that um um uh, some people on the call will know that for 
a decade, the, uni- the, um, the UK had this brilliant body of independent experts called the Sustainable Development Commission. And, uh, and I, I went to speak at their 10th anniversary meeting. Um, and this was in 2010. And I remember that for, for, for what came next. Um, and no minister from the UK government turned up. And it turned out that uh, they, they, they had literally been in office a, a matter of weeks, the, the, the Tory Liberal Democrat coalition, and just disbanded the Sustainable Development Commission, which only found out afterwards that it had been disbanded by the fact that the minister didn't turn up. And, uh, and so, you know, I, I was so angry about this because of the fact that it had independently advised governments of all political colours really well across the UK for a decade, given us really solid advice on what was the art of the possible. And the next week was the, um, in our case, the, the Labour Party manifesto meeting with members Um and so this is just taking Graham, Graham's point about carpe diem. The next week was the Labour Party manifesto meeting with members. So I put an urgent resolution <laughs> to propose a law for long term thinking <laughs> uh, to that uh, to that group of people um, who passed it because it, I was very strongly supported by the First Minister of Wales, Rodri Morgan at the time. And so essentially the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act came about because we learned we couldn't deliver on the duty to promote in a meaningful way. We needed legislation and that legislation needed to have certain characteristics. It had to have an independent commissioner, i.e. somebody who's completely independent of government. But government also had to be accountable to the legislation which is really Mm. unusual, but I was absolutely determined that that would be the case. Otherwise, government would make legislation for others. And I wanted to to, um, narrow this gap between rhetoric and delivery, because if government had to do it, then it would have to work with others to deliver in it. It had to be independently audited, hence we used the the Auditor uh, General um, in in Wales. and that it had to apply to all public services in Wales and the responsibility of government. So that all came about actually because of each of the failures in those aspects in the years running up to delivery. So I think there's a sort of failing forward and carpe diem agenda. And I often you know, want to, want, want to thank David Cameron because without David Cameron, <laughs> we would not have the well-being <laughs> of Future Generations Act in Wales. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, Jane. And this is, yeah, it's a wonderful story to really illustrate this sort of um, opportunity to seize the moment, literally seize the moment, you know, every day think about what, what is happening now, where is that energy, and how do we jump on that to push more of this agenda forward. Um, Simon, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that around, you know, and the complexity of what well, the complexity of the infrastructures and the systems and institutions, where do we start and who who needs to be driving this? Oh, I mean, I, I, I agree with what um, yeah, Jane and Graham have said. I think that the way I would put it is that just there needs to be an opportunity or a window and there needs to be an agent who's got their bit between the teeth and really wants to make it happen. And this can be very bottom up. It can be social movements putting pressure, as Graham suggested. It, it can be uh, someone like... Um, Jane, who is you know committed to this and 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 pushes hard to get it through, um, and it can involve things like you know making coalitions and building links and bridges with others, and that, that's one reason I began by saying how short termism matters for a whole raft of issues, uh, because some people aren't as bothered about the environment as others are, but they are worried about underinvestment in schools in health, in um, education, um, in foreign policy, uh, and so on. So I think the only ingredient I would add is, you know, this involves working with others, trying to build coalitions to get it through. Great, thank you, Simon. Um, I'm going to start um, picking up some questions from uh, from the audience. There's a question from Michelle for you, Simon. Um, I think also, Graham, you might want to weigh in on that as well. So how do we choose um, who we involve on a future council? How do we make sure this isn't hijacked by vested interests? 
and who decides what's important, um, as this is a value judgment and people have different values. And I suppose that that question could be transferable to citizen assemblies as well, and sort of a lot of the sort of deliberative um, forums and groups that we, we try and bring together to push some of this work. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I will say some things, but I, what I will say is I don't have a blueprint. I think in a way, and this, this fits with points that Graham was making, I think any form that some institution should take should come out of a democratic process of deliberation. So, but his suggestion, I think we should have actually something a bit like the Sustainable Development, sorry, the Sustainable Development Commission that Jane mentioned, which is comprised of experts in um, relevant areas, and you might broaden it, include climate scientists and environmental scientists, social scientists, demographers, and they can issue, uh, should issue reports on future trends and, and developments, and they can be appointed by professional bodies within uh, academia, for example. But then there's the question about what themes, uh, and I'll just illustrate what uh, an issue, which is, I remember when I first picked up some of the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, one of the chapters was, was the impact of climate change on the tourist industry. And I, I thought, that's kind of weird. Why? I mean, it matters, but why is that a theme? And someone is choosing the themes, and it's really important that the themes and the focus is that the research is on are ones that people care about. So then my suggestion would, would be that a combination of politicians but citizens' assemblies can say, these are the kinds of things that we care about. I know in Wales there was sort of a national conversation for Wales about what the goal should be. You, you can have deliberative fora. You say, well, what are the things that we care about? And then ensure that the, uh, the council produces a report that is responsive to these things and not ones that some politician, for example, has, has selected as the thing that matters. And just a slight contrast. So, for example, in Finland, there is something a little bit like this, but the government chooses the themes. And the government says, we would like a report on such and such a topic. Well, I think that's, that's better than nothing, but wouldn't it be much better to have a democratic discussion and, and say that the themes to be identified are ones that should emerge from this process of consultation? And then we'll have a sense of what kind of society we're heading towards, what the opportunities might be, what the threats might be. So that that's yeah, that's my answer. But I'd be interested to know, yeah, if people think that wouldn't work or they're worried about it. Great, thank you, so Simon. On, yeah, Graham. On, on that on that issue um, elsewhere, I, it, it wasn't discussed at the moment. But I actually think that. Um, something like the, the the Future Generations Commissioner in Wales um, would do well to embed something like um, a permanent citizens' assembly as part of their work, because there was a real danger that you have this kind of... The, the, the Future Generations Commissioner, Sophie's great, but she's part of the political class, and there's a, sort, there's a sense in which there's a discussion going on amongst the political class, and she does a lot of really good participatory work. But I think actually having assemblies... Um, which are helping co-create agendas and which are scrutinizing the work that she's doing would be really, really useful. And I actually think that, that would be a way. One of the problems you've got with these future generations, commissioners and councils and others is the story that Jane said, which is they start they start affecting the short term decisions of politicians and politicians then start questioning their legitimacy. This is what happened in Israel. This is what happened in Hungary. But if you start embedding your practices within democratic institutions like assemblies, like broader public engagement, and you can develop a, a popular legitimacy. Actually, it defends you against politicians who start to think, oh, maybe we could get rid of this institution. So I think there are there are good reasons for doing it for the decision, for, for the work, the good, the, the sound functioning of the institution. But I also see it as a way of defending against those people who would wish to undermine that institution. So um, th there's a couple of reasons why I, I would kind of agree with Simon's sort of Simon's approach. I think the Welsh, the, the fact that the Welsh Commissioner has embedded so much of her work through participatory processes is the right is is a move in the right direction. Yeah, great. Thank you, Graham and Jane. Yes. Yeah, um, I want to go back um, uh, to what Simon was saying about um, the consultation that preceded. Um, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, because I think this is an absolutely critical point. 
Um, in fact, there'd been many years of consultation because when we, when I took that proposal to cabinet about making sustainable development the central organising principle of government, um, so it sounds very Stalinist, but it was just trying to get at the idea that if we were going to really deliver on this, it had to become central to delivery. We we created at the time a um, a, a, a a vision that was called One Wales, One Planet. And it was very much about um, bringing down our ecological and carbon footprint. And the narrative behind that was actually created by the civil, by civil society. And, uh, and that was really important to me in the whole of my ministerial career, both in, in, in education and um, in sustainability, that, that it wasn't just a hierarchical approach about government telling people what to do, but that actually, how how you integrated the idea of what people wanted in their lives with what government could or could not do. And in our case at the time, I have to say, there were more, more things we couldn't do as a government because it didn't have lawmaking powers at that time. But the, the really important element was that this narrative um, was then built upon and then tested not by government, but by the Wales Council of Voluntary Action, which has literally hundreds of thousands of members of all the, you know, all the sort of voluntary sector, the civil society sector uh, across Wales. And they consulted um, on a Wales we want at the same time that the UN was consulting on the world we want. So the two things came together. It was effectively is what could delivery of the sustainable development goals look like in Wales? And that was... That was really important because I, there were lots of people, um, particularly people who'd supported um, another Welsh initiative, which I was absolutely privileged to be part of, which was when Wales became the first fair trade country in the world back in 2008. It was exactly the same values that were driving that. And they're very, very strong community values in Wales, strong values around community, about equality, around environment. And when you actually talk to people in Wales about what they want, oddly enough, the people aren't saying they want the kind of the yachts and the and the stuff. Is actually they 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 want to feel that they want sufficient money to live lives in a beautiful place in strong communities. So strong communities is a massive focus in terms of Welsh um, uh, policy and, and delivery. And therefore, what was wonderful for me was that when the consultation happened on the Wales we want uh, at the same time for, uh, as the SDG consultation, it actually, re uh, it, it, it actually um, made clear that what we'd done back in 2009 was still where people wanted to be. Now, it might be. I mean, the cynic would say, well, that's because the same people responded. <laughs> but actually, the difference was that we did the first one as a government um, uh, consultation. And yet when it was consulted on not through a government, but completely very much civil society talking to itself, we were getting the same outcomes. And that has meant that we have huge confidence. And I, the slide you didn't see, but you heard me say, was when we talked about the fact that normally when we think about sustainability, we think about environment, economy and society. And we added culture as a fourth pillar. And I think that that is the most critical one of all, because it's the culture and identity of nations, of organisations, of businesses, of governments and, and, and everything that actually drives behaviour. Um, so if you can actually play to the identity and culture and what people want to see in their environment, very much focused on place. And I know you looked at that um, uh, with Indigenous speakers last right. time then you've got something really strong uh, to offer. And the big gap in Wales, if I'm brutally honest, is the fact that because this is such a big change, <laughs> that actually the government has kept it quiet. The government has not really gone out to the people and said, we've got a Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. You can challenge us now and not thinking long term. <laughs> <laughs> and none of the public services are saying that either. And I so the big step forward for me is that the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act has to be become a people's act where people use it 
to demand more, where democracy and civil society can use it to demand more of their governments because there is legislation about what government at all levels and the public services should be doing. Wonderful. Thank you, Jane. You've probably seen in the chat. I think you're attracting more following in Wales. You, <laughs> I suspect you're going to have a population increase very soon. <laughs> more constituents. Um, there's a really interesting question um, that's come through um, that uh, is mainly um, in relation to sort of sex skeptics in this space, so politicians, leaders, um, funders, um, who might perceive that, um, you know, there is potentially lack of capacity or capability to do this, this, this stuff well. So it could be, I think, Jane, you mentioned, you know, civil servants don't know how to do this. Um, I, I know I've heard time and time again, you know, people say or leaders say communities don't know what they want. They can't think long term. So why are we asking them? Um, so how would you and I'm sure you've sort of come across across your work, um, you know, lots of these possible skeptics. So how do you come back um, on some of these uh, potential challenges and how do you bring people on to your side to trust that um, communities are worth listening to communities know what they want in the future and these the capacity and capability can be built to do some of this work well and that's a question to all of you can i just start with a, a um a point i've already made but just to reaffirm that one of the things I love about um, Graham's work is this idea of the deliberative approaches um, and how they can and, and how actually using um, that random selection and deliberative approach um, actually demonstrates time and time again that the public uh, can reach really um, positive and interesting and valid um, recommendations that uh, can be can be utilised by governments. And then the big issue for me is how you get the governments to agree to take them on rather than just having a citizens assembly and then and saying, thank you very much. I'm delighted you're so well informed um, and <laughs> we'll come back to you. But you you haven't given us what we want to hear. So we'll go and find another set of randomly selected people. So I think there's 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 something about um, that for me. And I think the other thing is, is that um, often when I talk about the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, and I, I need to say that, yes, I was the person who proposed it. Um, yes, I was the person who um, uh, put some of the core elements within it. But it was that next generation of politicians who passed it. I'd left by then. I was needling <laughs> from the outside. Um, yeah. and, and therefore, I absolutely pay tribute to them for... Um, because they effectively operated like a, a political citizens assembly and came to the same conclusions that I'd spent seven years reaching. Um, so I think that there's, you know, when you do give people more information, you give them chance to debate and consider, then I think people do. And it's not just in, in, in random selection. I think across political parties that can happen as well through really good parliamentary structures. So I just want to put a kind of a shout out for parliamentary inputs there as opposed to government inputs. And I think that the, the really important aspect of, of the legislation, I think that will make it, hopefully make it last, is that it has a what and a how. And it's mm -hmm. the how, I don't know. I mean, Simon may well know how many pieces of legislation actually give you a process for how you act. You know, if you have to be preventative, you have to be long-term, you have to be collaborative. Um, you have to involve people about whom decisions are being made. Um, and you have to integrate outcomes. And, and the mechanism is, is mucky, messy, because it is judicial review, but there is a legal mechanism whereby that. any of those public services can be called out for not doing those things. And they're all still learning. So I think, I think that there's an issue of, have you, if legislation had a what and a how, we would be much more confident. And that's why I mentioned the ratcheting up elements. Because if you have regulations mm. that ratchet up, then actually, um, just as the Climate Act does, then that gives the UK Climate Change Commission massive power in terms of its influence on governments in what it needs to do in climate budgets. So you could see potentially that that model could be exerted in many other fields as well. <laughs> 
Great, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, Simon Green, do you want to add anything to that? I've got loads of other questions otherwise. <laughs> add something just on the last point about the Climate Change Commission um, or the, in the UK, which is a really interesting body, but can suffer from that, um, you know, kind of it, 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 it's kind of changed its way. It's changing its way of working. And one of the reasons is that Chris Stark, the director uh, of, of was actually one of the expert leads of the Climate Assembly UK. And he thought that public engagement was just public communication. You just had to tell people about what they needed to do. But he's completely <laughs> changed his perspective on what's needed. And, and actually, C the CCC now is, 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 is going to be employing people to do significant public engagement work. And I think that's really exciting when a body that, that is basically a bunch of scientists and a bunch of experts realise that they can gain a lot through understanding how the public think about these things and how they were and what not just what's publicly acceptable but actually thinking through okay how 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 can we involve the public in our decision making of holding government to account i think that's really really fascinating and a real really really important development yeah that's great man. yeah the only thing i'll add because i think your initial question was about yeah people who oppose these transitions or and mm -hmm. I think it's always worth asking kind of or figuring out why they do, because there are different reasons. So I know when I talk to, you know, just lots of everyday citizens, they're, they're worried about um, you know, getting jobs, about education, about health. And they some of them worry that if you are committed to protecting the future, there's a trade off and they're going to mm -hmm. be worse off now. And I think that's something that those of us who campaign for future generations have to take very seriously. And I think, I, mean, I think there are good replies to that. I think there are important ways of protecting the future that that produce social justice right here and now. And it, actually, this is what kicked off in France. Um, and Graham mentioned uh, the yellow vests. And there was this um, phrase used by Nicola Hulot, who was the environment minister of the time, which was, they're thinking about the end of the month, not the end of the world. And, and I think, um, so they're thinking about paying the bills uh, and uh, Macron was telling them, well, should we care about climate change in the long term? And I think, you know, skillful politicians then or any advocate for these has to take seriously people's concerns for the, uh, yeah, the end of the month. So that's a perfectly, I think, legitimate concern that people might have that can be met. And then there are those, as Graham says, who have vested interests that are short term and want to subvert the democratic process. Um, and, you know, there's just different reasons people have for having reservations. My experience, which is, is more limited, I should say, than the other two, is often people are actually committed to the future, but there's a mismatch between that vague aspiration uh, and the practical realities. And if you ask them about the long term, they're all in favour of it. But if you ask about, you say, well, in the short term, that means to do A, B, C and D. That's when they get a bit more nervous or they're not sure about how to do it. So, yeah, the short version is people, I think, have different reasons and it's worth being responsive to the different kinds of reasons. Thank you, Simon. That was really clear and very, very illustrative. Actually, a follow on uh, from that, there's a quick question addressed to you from Tim Stanyan, who um, you know, doesn't want to be the devil's advocate, but is wondering whether um, you know, some of the ideas that you suggested towards the end of your presentation, whether um, some of these might start to set up um, you know, futures um, approaches and, and interventions as separate institutions. Um, which could reinforce some of the silos that we currently see in, you know, in our in our political system, um, our government, and how it's organised. Whether sort of futures being sort of a standalone set of interventions, councils, assemblies, um, could be problematic and could further some of these silos. Yeah, maybe I should just kick off and then. But I'd really like to know what the others think. I mean, there is a serious worry that if you designate a body as the future generation's body, then there's a licensing effect and everyone thinks, oh, phew, right, that's not my job, that's their job. Yeah. And that, that, would be, that would be a problem. And uh, in the academic literature, some people propose things like future generation as sort of representatives as a, in addition to normal uh, MPs. And, and I, I do worry about that effect. 
So I do think it should be mainstream through all political decisions. One thing I didn't mention, but the, the Harvard uh, political theorist Dennis Thompson has said there should be posterity impact reports that for any legislation, there's an account of what will be its long-term impacts. And those that's brought into the democratic uh, discussion. And lots of climate scientists talk about what they call committed emissions. So you might say, if you go ahead with this project, what are its long-term uh, impacts, you know, how many emissions is it committing us to? And I fully support those. I think basically we should have two kinds of things. We should have some bodies whose role it is uh, to campaign for the future, but that should be combined with mainstreaming it so that for any, let's say, government ministry, it has to think about its long-term effects. And I suppose what I think is we need the future-oriented institutions to get the others. If we just said to everyone, oh, you think about the future, it wouldn't get done. Mm -hmm. That's my wager. And if we think about other bodies, you know, we often have things like ombudsman for, for children. Of course, the plight of children should fall into many different ministries, but it's important to have a designated, almost a gadfly, pushing this agenda to say to the rest of us, what are you doing about that? Why isn't it on your agenda? Um, how come you're committing to having a new say, coal mine in Cumbria, which is in the north of England, when we've got COP26 coming up? Uh, so both in, in a sense is my answer, but I do worry about the point being made that there is a, there could be a licensing effect. Yeah, yeah. can I pick, pick that up? Because I, I, mm -hmm. I couldn't agree with you more, Simon, on, on, on that point. Um, when I took on the responsibility um, in the context of sustainability, I had a conversation with the first minister and that partly this was because we were in coalition at the time um, uh, anyway, so that the deputy first minister was from Plaid Cymru um, uh, and therefore, you know, I was below that, uh, but below him in, um, uh, in, in terms of the authority of cabinet. So I asked the first minister to give me his authority as the cabinet minister responsible for sustainability, so that I had the authority to talk to all ministers in the cabinet. Mm. And it was a really important distinction so that I was that gadfly. I could literally intervene, comment in every single part of government. And I think that, that if we're serious about future generations, that would be in many ways for me, the single most important thing that a government could do is to have that sort of minister without portfolio responsibility in the context of future generations um, who would then go and tell every other minister whether the action they were taking was, was um, uh, either in the interests of future gen generations or not in the interests of future generations, which means there would have been therefore an internal um, battle in the cabinet, which obviously there is at the moment, we know behind the scenes in the context of that coal mine, but it should never ever have seen the light of day, mm. um, particularly in the in the year of COP. So I think having provided it somebody who has authority and that authority is granted by the prime minister. So if somebody acts on behalf of the prime minister for future generations, there's a, there's a model I think that could be considered here. I just, I just say, you know, what, what's really interesting about the Welsh legislation, as Jane's already said, is that it's an obligation on all public authorities. And it's not like it's something that they're trying to mainstream into it. I mean, this has always been a problem. You know, you create like a gender unit or an equalities unit and everybody thinks, oh, that's what they, they do equalities. We don't need to. And so, yeah. so, so that that is a real challenge. I think I can explain that this has happened in a couple of places where where parliaments have tried uh, there's been discussions about creating um committees for the future which would um be able to pick any piece of legislation and kind of review it on those grounds um and almost all parliaments have balked on that because you know everyone wants to keep control of their particular part of the oh i want to, I, we're in charge of education we're in charge of it's a real dynamic of parliaments it's a dynamic of uh governments it's a dynamic of any institution where you get that mm. kind of siloed way of thinking. And the real critical thing here is creating those champions, but also finding a way of mainstreaming it. And I mean, you know, this is what feminists, institutional feminists have been trying to do for years. And they're having, you know, they've, they've been working on this in, in many ways much longer. But I think it's, a, you know, it, it is find, finding ways through that is, is the real challenge in the way that Simon and Jane have said. Mm. 
That's great. Thank you all. I think that's there's a clear consensus there that it's fundamentally about ways of organizing and how and how we enable um, some of these sort of new structures we're creating to have more influence and autonomy across the board and how that's embedded in all of our institutions. Um, there is a question from Alec Robertson, um, who wonders whether uh, the climate emergency might be too urgent for slow democratic processes. Um, some believe a world communist totalitarian government by unelected bureaucrats supported by a social credit monetary system that controls the behavior of people might be the best way to save the planet for future generations. What do you think? Go on, Graham. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Graham. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize. That, uh, yes, I thought I'd, I'd, I thought I'd better un unmute myself. Um, so I'm, I'm the <laughs> professor of the Center for Study of Democracy. So I'm going to have a real issue here. So first of all, th there's a couple there's a couple of things I want to say. Um, one, one thing is that the climate emergency is not one thing. It's going to be it's going to happen over time. I mean, we are going to have to govern ourselves in in a he on a heated planet for many. So it's not like a one shot thing or clearly we need to mitigate yeah. as soon as possible. But we are going to have to have significant adaptation as well. Um, and the history of autocracies is pretty poor when it comes to most environmental health, whatever indicators. They tend to concentrate power. You know, even there is, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't really been a benign, the idea of a sort of environmentally benign dictatorship in, on paper seems fine, but all dictate, not all, yes, pretty much all dictatorships corrupt. And the other thing that problem with centralized government is information flows are really terrible. I mean, one of the real problems that China has and you know is always fighting with is this problem of local public officials don't want to tell the top of the tree if, if things have gone wrong. And you know, one of the one of the analyses of the pandemic is that local officials weren't telling national government what was happening. I don't know how true that is, but it's just an example of a of, of a generic problem within authoritarian governments of you just don't have different flows of information. So I think, so I'm a committed Democrat anyway. So I, I you know, I'm someone who, who believes that we should be, that this, this, this is a, this is the, the, the best form of government that we've invented so far, that the kinds of rights and practices that we have in, in, in democracies are worth, worth fighting for. And I think that democracies can deal with these things. And I think over time, democracies will be more stable to deal with the kinds of emergency conditions that are going to emerge. So it isn't a one shot. Dealing with sustainability is a way of being over time. It isn't kind of like we achieve it and then we can go back to being a democracy. It's actually something we have to try and figure out ways of working which are more uh, reflexive, which are more responsive um, to deal with the kinds of challenges we've got. And my, my sense is democracies don't always get this right, but they it, 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 the evidence, as far as I can see it, is they continually out, outperform autocracy. So th for me, this is the best game in town and we've got to try and figure out how to make it work better. So that, that would be my answer. Thank you, Graham. Um, I'm happy um, to, go, to go next and leave Simon the last <laughs> word. <laughs> um, I actually, the, because climate is now urgent, that is the thing that gives me the most hope in the context of democracies, because you know Paris is a legal agreement. It has mechanisms within it. I'm pretty confident that um, we, that those of us who are passionate, almost zealot-like about this, uh, will not get what we want. But I hope that what we'll get, not least because of that ratchet mechanism, um, is something that we can live with in the context of. Um, of, of outcomes of COP and COP will only be, it's not an end game, it's a, stage, it's a staging post like any others. But I think that the you know, all the things that we've seen that have um, uh, pressured governments across the world uh, in the context of, of, of weather change uh, and impacts are definitely concentrating minds in a way that's not been done before. I think the second aspect is, is that when you now talk to um, uh, actuaries, um, uh, risk insurers, uh, investment houses, all of which I've been doing in the last few weeks, there is a much greater awareness of issues around the way finance contributes towards climate change. And this comes back to my 
point about regulation. You know, at the moment, all those organisations that move the, the money around the world um, are not um, bound to take climate as a major KPI in the context of a key performance indicator in the context of how those decisions are made about investment or anything else. Some do voluntarily, but others don't. And I think there's a huge opportunity for governments to actually um, regulate the financial industry in the context of the mandated um, KPIs, just as currently they look at mortality and morbidity, for example, in the context of risk. So I think there are there are some ways that we could be quiet in the context of the public at large, but actually have massive impacts. My personal one is I, I you know, I just want a major campaign about keep it in the ground. Um, and everybody's telling me it can't be done. And I think, yes, of course it can. Um, it can, but if we had a moratorium for a period of time, perhaps starting next year, in the context of, of saying, well, let's have a moratorium across the world on any new exploration or development that gives us the time to find some of the alternatives. Um, and I think that actually, unless you do something big and cataclysmic to change the frame, um, mm -hmm. then actually the frame doesn't change because everybody argues why it will affect them in particular ways. And the final point is actually the reason that democracy is better, and, uh, and I'm an absolute supporter of democracy, um, is that actually if the people are engaged in wanting more of their government, they can drive their governments to, new, to different kinds of behaviour. And I think the bit that we're not seeing yet is we've, we're seeing a separation between the sort of activism and people who do believe something needs to happen, but who are still sitting behind their, 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 their desks or on their sofas. So there's something about if we do believe that this is urgent and necessary, every single person on this call today, at the very least, needs to be writing to their member of parliament about just what action they want to see at COP. You can't be on a call like this and go away and take no action. So let's get some stubborn optimism out of some activism and find the activism that's right for you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Simon, do you want to add anything to that? And I'm conscious of time, so we will need to wrap up soon. Yeah, just very quickly, so I, I very much agree with what Graham and Jane have said. Um, just two other things I would quickly add. And I, I think one thing that sometimes people are prone to do is have a bit of wishful thinking. So they think these people are very short termist, they're very myopic. Let's hypothesize some kind of savior who, who rides in on a, it's like a Westerns I used to watch as a boy, who'd come up, sort out the town and then ride off into the sunset. And I think, I mean, I think we all have to worry about this. So uh, we all have to worry, is my solution just assuming some idealized people who are not vulnerable to all the other problems that I've talked about? And I think the arguments from authoritarian approach are a, a classic kind of case for this, because as, as Graham said, in, in reality, most authoritarian regimes are pretty short term. Many of them are, are worrying about their survival and so having to buy off cliques and cronies and so on. But there's a deeper point about idealization I think we should all bear in mind. And the other thing to bear in mind, and I'm thinking especially of the US, is the way someone might think, look, there's a democracy, it hasn't done much on climate change, democracy can't cope. There's another lesson, which is there are actors in that system who are trying to thwart the democratic process. And, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking here of public utility companies and, and fossil fuel companies that have, have obstructed climate legislation in the US. Um, I will see whether the, you know, uh, the Biden one can get through, but I wouldn't want someone to think that's a perfectly functioning democratic system. It's dragging its feet. There's a problem with democracy. There's another lesson we might learn from that. Great. Thank you, Simon. Um, this is all the time that we have uh, for questions. There were so many questions. I think we just needed an extra hour <laughs> to go through all of them. But I hope that uh, I tried to sort of select some of the questions that really stood out or um, yeah, where there were overlaps, that it's some, some combining. So I hope um, everyone in the audience 
felt that you you could get um, some insights um, around some of the things that you were interested in finding out more about. And I just want to leave you all with that sort of very clear call to action from Jane, you know, in a world where we feel that our fates are in the hands of politicians, let's reframe that and think about how far we can push our politicians. Um, so thank you so much to our wonderful speakers, Simon, uh, Graham and Jane. Also a big thank you to Philippa Dithi, Director of R RSA Oceania, who curated today's event and the Reclaiming the Future series. If you enjoyed this event, uh, we encourage you to register for the next one in the series on the 21st of October, which is about dealing with uncertainty and developing a futures culture. You can find the link to this event in the chat, we'll pop, we'll, we'll pop that in, um, as well as the link to the series page. We also want to invite you to explore our new Regenerative Futures programme, which we launched just yesterday. So we just published uh, our new paper cha challenging us to make the shift collectively from sustainable to regenerative long-term thinking. Uh, we have a number of events, activities and articles coming up over the next few weeks in the lead up and during COP26. Uh, so we'll post a link to the campaign in the chat and you can follow uh, hashtag join the regeneration to find out about what's going on and to share your own work in this space. Uh, so, so thank you everyone so much for attending today's session. Uh, we now invite you all to unmute and say farewell. Thank you. 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 Thank you.